Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, as natural, National MS Awareness Month kicks off, we're chatting about the fight to manage, treat, and hopefully someday cure multiple sclerosis with special guests. Sarah Loud, CEO of the Accelerated Cure Project for Multiple Sclerosis, Gina Murdoch, the President and CEO of Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and Cindy Zagiboilo, President and CEO of the National MS Society. So thank you all for joining us. It's great to to, uh, have you here to talk about this really important topic. MS is a disease of the central nervous system that can cause balance issues, weakened vision, fatigue, and other unpredictable symptoms. Its cause is unknown and there's no cure. It's twice to three times more common in women than men. And about 2.8 million people around the world live with MS, nearly a million Americans. And that's a vast undercount uh, because uh, people just really don't necessarily identify the disease where it happens in the United States, where we're a bit ahead of the curve. The organizations that you lead really cover a, a huge gamut of services, of research, of, of scientists, of volunteers uh, who support uh, work on this. So, Sarah, um, could you take us away, please, and give us a sense of the Accelerated Cure Project for MS? Sure. Thank you, Mark. So for the millions of people living worldwide with MS and for the people who are diagnosed every day and for their loved ones, the diagnosis of MS can be devastating and create uncertainty about their future and can leave them feeling powerless and isolated. At Accelerated Cure Project, we give them an opportunity to regain their power through research, not just participating as a research subject, but actually as a driver and shaper of research. We bring together the lived experience experts, the people who are living with the disease and their caregivers, and put them into collaborative conversations with researchers who are propelling the science forward for cures, for better treatments, for better quality of life, and ensure that the research that gets accelerated as a result is focused on the needs and priorities of people living with the disease. And we bring together other stakeholders too, like funders, like healthcare providers, and like my partners here on this this webinar to participate in these conversations and to ensure that people living with MS and their caregivers have a say in what gets studied, how research studies are designed, how success is defined, how research is disseminated, and how that evidence is incorporated into the healthcare setting. And we have a particular focus on ensuring that not only is the research patient-centered and people-centered, but also that it's diverse and inclusive. Since 2016, we've been working on a number of initiatives that have been focused on ensuring diversity from race and ethnicity, from age, gender, sex, ability, all dimensions so that the research is done, it's accelerated, it's inclusive and represents all people living with MS. What's really important here is that not only is this about justice, but it's also about practicality and and finding information because uh, people who have different lived experiences, people who come from different genetic backgrounds, who uh, people who have um, a, a different life arc, they have different data to contribute to the scientific research that needs to be undertaken. And that data, the range of data, the diversity of data is actually key to solving this puzzle, right, Sarah? Absolutely. And so we say that the the research that's done, if it's not inclusive of all, it's not applicable to all. And to your point, the diversity of experiences and the richness of the data and the patient experience and their, their life and their clinical experience, all of the above is central to cracking the mystery of MS. And Gina, your organization is is quite a bit different. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, just sort of give us an orientation and then we'll uh, move on to Cindy. Then we're going to come back. And we're going to really uh, delve deeply. But the MS Association has been around for quite a while. Actually, in June, we'll be celebrating uh, 52 years in the MS space. And the organization was started by a gentleman whose wife was living with MS and really felt there needed to be a focus on quality of life, of living with the disease, and how, how somebody can have MS and still reach for all of their goals. So our organization really focuses on providing free programs and services to the MS community in a couple of different ways through direct programs, 
as well as really being a convener of critical conversations in the MS community. So a couple of the things that we do is we provide an MRI access fund. So an MRI is a critical tool in diagnosing MS to looking at progression or determining if somebody needs to change treatment therapies and, and how they're addressing their MS. So we work with providing uh, MRI funding to those who are under 300% of the federal poverty level. And so we do work with those who are impacted with MS who are really at the most critical stage and need that help. So MSAA really looks at how we can support those individuals. Um, otherwise, they would not be able to get onto treatment. They would not be able to monitor progression. And so that barrier um, is eliminated by MSAA and our work with our partners. We also have a helpline that really works and, and gives that, that compassionate voice. Um, and whether it's, it's uh, programs and services that MSAA provides, either of our partners here, we refer over whatever help an individual needs, MSAA can be a clearinghouse for that information. Um, we also really look at um, having information in various languages. As uh, Sarah had put forward, we've done a lot of work in the health equity space. So some of the work we've done around that is we have a Latinx advisory board and an African-American advisory board that we've developed. And this is comp comprised of individuals who are living with MS, care partners, as well as healthcare providers, all from those communities. And this has been a big area of focus for our organization, really having them come together and educate MSAA on barriers to care, um, lack of access, concerns about the medical community, understanding about the differences, really bringing all of those voices together. Um, we have uh, issued white papers about that, so really want to share the information that we have with the whole MS community, um, as well as doing programs as, since we are in MS Awareness Month. Uh, really focusing on a theme of shaping the MS experience and talking about things like um, understanding progression and choosing a therapy, um, all of those aspects. So what we really look to do is keep that individual living with MS at the center of everything we're doing, convening voices around that individual so that they can educate us about what the gaps are, what the needs are, how we can help as an organization, how we can improve quality of life, how we really can help an individual become an empowered self-advocate in their treatment decisions and in their protocol decisions, and really disseminate and share that information with other members of the MS community or other members of, of other chronic disease communities so that we can work together to help. And these kinds of models where we have different uh, organizations like yours, Cindy, that uh, take different parts of this space. We see this deployed in the ALS world. We see this employed, uh, deployed in the muscular dy dystrophy world, in the rare cancer world. Talk a little bit, Cindy, about uh, your cut uh, on, on serving the community. Mm. Well, I think one of the things that you see that's consistent is that um, that we are we start with people who are affected by MS and bring the world together. So the National MS Society is a movement, the largest movement in the world by and for people affected by MS. We have a long history of amplifying the voices of people with MS and ensuring that they that that they can receive the trusted information, trusted information. We know there's lots of information. We're talking about trusted and vetted information about MS, and also fueling research and collaboration to accelerate the scientific discoveries we need to reach MS cures. So our mission at the National MS Society is we will cure MS while empowering people affected by MS to live their best lives. And later this month. Our Pathways to Cures Roadmap will be published in the scientific publication focused uh, uh, called MS Journal, which is the most widely read uh, journal about multiple scientific journal about multiple sclerosis among MS researchers and clinicians. And this article will outline the discoveries and steps needed to reach MS cures. There, there are, we're focused on three pathways to reach cures, stopping MS, which Essentially, we define as no new disease activity. In other words, just stopping it, 
as soon as as soon as we identify it, restoring a lost function, which means re- reversing symptoms and disability, getting back what MS has taken away, and ending MS. And, and ending MS has to do with preventing MS, which has become a real um, possibility. We can see that in the future. Uh, first, we'll focus on people at high risk for developing MS, and then for the general population. So our vision, of course, is a world free of MS. And we have gained global agreement that this roadmap that will be published in just a couple of weeks will lead to MS cures. And um, we expect it will inspire collaboration and accelerate the progress. Another part. Yep, go ahead. One of the things that I really love about going around this table is that there's not just one um, uh, uh, silver bullet approach, right? You have uh, local uh, requirements. You have uh, requirements of sharing information, of debating information, of debating approaches, of of really uh, criticizing each approach, each each research thread, so that rare resources are appropriately invested. Right. This is basically mixing it up. It's people mixing it up, all dedicated to finding a solution. And at that point, right when you when you have the the question of ego versus a solution, you're going to pick a solution, right? I mean, no matter who you are, you really want to get rid of this disease, don't you, Cindy? That, that's right. That's that's exactly right. And, um, and bringing people together to bring their ideas forward, to giving them a place to share what their thoughts are. And, you know, scientists, clinicians, but most importantly, people with MS who tell us what they need and what solutions they want. Um, Another area that we focus on at the National MS Society is to empower people to live their best lives. And um, by providing, one of the things that we do is provide one-on-one partnership so people can work through the individual challenges that they have and that they experience um, with our, through our MS Navigator program. So lots of, of work we do. The National MS Society is the largest network of people who care about MS in the world. Uh, we're the largest MS Society in the world. And we work a, a lot in the international space because we don't care where in the world a cure is found as long as people can get it. And, and you know, we really want everyone to be able to plug in and feel at home here and contribute what they can and get what they need. Let's talk a little bit about what I am likely to experience in the early days where there might be warning signs that I have MS. What am I likely to experience? Gina, uh, could you could you sort of walk us through this uh, initially? Sure. I mean, the, the challenge with getting an MS diagnosis is symptoms can ebb and flow. It might be that you have vision issues. It might be that you have tingling or numbness in, in a part of your body, or you lose feeling in a t- part of your body. And what it makes it such a challenge are the ebb and flow of those symptoms. So we really encourage people to look at those symptoms. When we're talking about the symptoms, it's so critical for the people understand. And that's what's so important about MS Awareness Month is raising awareness about MS, about the symptoms of MS, about the treatments of MS, so that if somebody is seeing those symptoms, that they can have that in their thought, they can talk to their healthcare provider and what that looks like in order to get get the, to the diagnosis, get to the healthcare provider and get onto their MS journey. Right. It could be, it could be balance. It could be uh, just feeling very fatigued. It, there are all sorts of different things, right? So, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not one thing. And, and I could be going, talking to a very knowledgeable doctor and the doctor could be thinking, well, you know, maybe he's tired or maybe he's had too much coffee to drink or maybe, it's neuropathy, or maybe it's it's something else, right? And and you're you're just wandering in the desert, and it doesn't mean that the person is a bad doctor, right? It's just that we're not we're not necessarily thinking about a conclusion yet, as we're traversing all these symptoms that then go away for a while. I think that um, you know the diversity of symptoms and the heterogeneous experience that people have, you know, really adds to the confusion about diagnosing MS. And then something else that you mentioned are, you know, we hear so much about these invisible symptoms, you know, so fatigue and pain and cognition and those types of things where people will say, "Well, you look fine." Um, and so I think some of those things are the types of things that healthcare providers might assume are stress or just day to day living. You know, many people are. Diagnosed 
diagnosed with MS in sort of the prime of their lives when they're balancing work and family and, you know, parents and being parents and all of the above. And those things contribute to fatigue and, and, you know, a sense of unwellness. So there, there is a, there is a challenge in the diagnosis process for sure. You know, we're just uh, uh, finishing up a poll here and we asked, have you or your family or friends been directly touched by MS or another condition that is rare and untreatable? And uh, uh, over 80 percent of the people said said yes. So th- this isn't just about MS. Right. If you take all these different conditions that are very rare and you stack them all on top of each other, uh, you're talking about a considerable uh, number of, of Americans and people globally. Uh, who are affected. Uh, mm-hmm. Cindy, once I get the diagnosis, what is the next step for me? If, I, if I'm yep. trying to get information, um, I can call uh, the National MS Society, the MS Association, or, or uh, local chapters. Um, what, what, what am I going to learn initially um, if I come to you and, and start to try and understand what's going on with my body? Well, I want to back up just a little bit, but because what you said was so important. First of all, MS is treatable. There are 22 treatments for MS. So MS is treatable and getting people diagnosed quickly is critical. The longer someone has MS and is not diagnosed and is untreated, the more damage that is that is very, very difficult to reverse. We're working on reversing all the damage, but it's, it's, that's the hardest part of curing MS is reversing the damage. So being diagnosed, it's tricky. Like Gina said, it's very hard to diagnose. You need an MS specialist to do that. So what we are to, working to do is raise awareness. So people, not only physicians and mental and healthcare providers, we're doing a lot of work in that space, making sure they have what they need to make an accurate diagnosis, but also so people, can go in and say, well, what about, could it be MS potentially? I'm having these symptoms. I'm connecting the dots of these things that have happened to me. Should I get that MRI? What, you know, so people can walk into a physician's office with that knowledge and power and empower. And, and so our goal at the MS Society, one of the ways to a cure is to identify MS as early, early as possible. And we want to get to it actually before it starts at some point to get people confirmed diagnosis very, very quickly and on on an effective therapy immediately. And you the closer know, we can move those together, it's the small we, smallest we can make that disease. It's such today. an important point. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's yeah. such an important point that you were yeah. making. When we don't know what the cause of a condition is, there might be some indicators, but we don't know. It's not like a broken arm right. where we can take an X-ray and it's clear, right? So it's all it is is a series of, uh, of ideas, information that... Um, changes the percentage chance of it being this or that condition. And eventually it tilts to an indication that it really is MS, but it takes a while to accumulate all that information. You have to collect a lot of information before you get to that diagnosis. So being aggressive in collecting information about your own symptoms and sharing that, and then moving towards specialists who are more adept at, at analyzing that data is really an important early step that you can take. One of the other things that I would uh, talk about as well as the importance of, and we're all doing some work in this area, wonderful work, is really raising awareness about who develops MS, that it is not uniquely for individuals of European descent. So what the Latinx board that we have, the African American uh, Advisory Board, both organizations, we're all doing a lot of work in this space, really to raise awareness in the healthcare community that those who are African-American and those who are Hispanic can develop MS. So really, really making sure that when we're going through that diagnosis, that healthcare providers do not have an idea that this could not be MS because this is an individual and really fighting against those preconceived notions of this is who, this is what I think of as the typical MS person. And I think that is a really critical aspect to, as Cindy said, getting people on treatment earlier, but it's also about raising awareness in different communities to ensure that that the healthcare providers are looking at that and are aware of just uh, the wide gamut of those who develop MS so that they're thinking of that, can make a diagnosis, can get people on treatment and can slow down the progression of the disease as early as possible. That's a really that's a really phenomenal point, right? The idea that that uh, someone who has MS uh, needs to have a certain 
um, uh, gender or, or racial makeup or whatever. It's just such a fallacy. And so we have to get over our, our preconceptions and look at the disease, look at the evidence, right, Sarah, as opposed to look at what we think coming into this process, because the disease is going to, is going to surprise us every time. Absolutely. And to your, to your point, Mark, I think that's so much about bringing as many people as possible into the research space. And, you know, the focus on at Accelerate Cure Project is making research accessible to all. So whether regardless of the role that you would like to play, whether you're designing studies or participating in them, whether you're interested in a, an intervention study or you're more interested in something that might be survey based or just focused around quality of life. I mean, there is a role for everyone in MS research. And, you know, what we've been talking a lot about in our organization is how do we change the conversation around research so that it's it's the norm, that it's, it's not the aspirational goal, but that it's actually, oh, yes, I have MS and I'm going to seek out research opportunities so that I can contribute to a cure and to better day-to-day living. Let's talk about exactly that, because you've all three raised this issue about power, the power of the patient and research threats. So let's stay with you for a, for a second, Sarah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the most interesting research threads that you're pursuing right now? Um, and then let's talk about the power of the patient for determining that, because this is not a situation which we have too often experienced in the past in which we all become science experiments, right? If we're going to be science experiments, we are going to determine those people who who live with this condition. We're going to determine exactly what happens. Right. So, Sarah, could you just talk a little bit about about some of the research threads that you're following? And then and then let's talk about the power of the patient. Absolutely. And I'm actually going to flip flop that and start with the power of the patient. So we have an initiative called I Conquer MS. It's an online people powered research network, and it's focused on the needs and perspectives of people living with MS. And for example, through um, through part of the initiative called Our Questions Have Power, we're actually developing the research agenda in partnership with people affected by the disease. So we had a focus on COVID-19, um, where we actually sourced and then funded with the National MS Society, uh, a really important set of studies around COVID-19 vaccine safety and effectiveness in people um, living with MS and and undergoing treatments of MS. And now we're focused on MS symptoms and their treatment. So we're working in collaboration uh, with people living with MS and caregivers to understand where, what their priorities are. What are the priority uh, research topics that we should be studying um, in, in the area of MS treatments, uh, MS symptoms and their treatment. And then we'll be bringing those folks together with researchers who are interested in these topics and with funders to drive that research research board. So we're really sourcing the research agenda through the power of the people affected by the disease. So, so important in our work with the AIDS community, for example, there's a big issue with aging with AIDS, right? In the ALS community, there's a real issue with assistive technologies and and how those assistive assistive technologies are, are working and also with quality of life issues and being able to uh, self-determine as as people become uh, as becomes more difficult for them to communicate. Right, each of these issues really uh, requires the patient to weigh in. The person who lives with as the empowered individual, right, Cindy, because that's really where it starts. It is not 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 a question for anybody else to decide in terms of what happens in terms of research, in terms of what happens in terms of treatment. It really is about the person who lives with ALS, uh, with with, uh, with MS. MS, yeah. We one of the things that we say all the time is that you know if you know one person with MS, you know one person's MS. MS is a different for every single person. It's very uniquely affects individuals. And so it has to start there. It has to start with those questions about what are your needs? What's your lifestyle? What are you trying to achieve in your life? What are your goals? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? And then start from there and, and, and figure out the best path forward. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, something that we're asking right now. We're asking to what extent should our medical system be obligated to treat those living with an incurable condition, and uh, Gina, you you uh, had had uh, touched on this issue. Um, we have a situation right now where, depending on 
on wealth and your health insurance uh, status, you can get reasonably good treatment or no treatment at all. Gina, how do you see this question about what the um, what civil society, how civil society ought to look at people who live with incurable uh, conditions? How should we actually function? Is it really a matter of the pe- of those with money uh, get the treatment and those without have to fend for themselves? Uh, I would blankly say no. Um, obviously, there we have an obligation, certainly both in the U.S. and globally, to those individuals who are really struggling to get the care that they need. We talk a lot about the right medication for the right person at the right time. And that is a fundamental view that certainly MSAA holds and I'm sure a lot of other organizations hold. I mean, for for us, we are, our MRI access program exists because individuals under 300% of the federal poverty level cannot afford an MRI. I am thrilled to provide this program, but I'm also heartbroken that I need to provide this particular program. And there's a lot of other organizations out there that that kind of piece together help, whether it's uh, programs and services, whether it's medication, whether other pieces. But we're all trying to piece together a situation to support an individual living with whatever that disease might be, trying to kind of put that support underneath them. Uh, In a humanistic way, we should not need all of our organizations providing that support but we as a human culture and a species should be providing that support for everyone. But I am very thankful for what MSAA does and what one of my other partners do, because collectively, at least for the MS space, we are working together to try to help out both immediate needs like MRI and access and, and long-term needs like research and a cure. So we are creating that foundation. We shouldn't need to, but we do. And I'm proud that we do together. I just want to invite everybody to participate in the public policy conference that's coming up. Um, March 6th through 8th, where we will be focusing on access to health care and access to affordable affordable therapies for everyone who has MS, to exactly your point, Mark. So look on the website and, um, and, and sign up for a, a virtual public policy conference. This is at the National MS Society website? That's right. Terrific, terrific. And we all right. we all participate in it. All these we all we all raise our voices so that we can have more affordable treatments and ensure um, excellent health care. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. We're going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. What do you feel is the future of MS treatment? Um, are we at the point now where we can actually see that light in which uh, treatment can become um, uh, available. Um, we're, we don't yet have any cure, right? We don't yet have more than uh, approaches to ameliorate symptoms, but we're going down this path that seems to be quite promising. What do you see happening over the next years? Well, I, I absolutely think, as Cindy pointed out, we have 22 treatments that are available that can help uh, people living with MS, uh, you know, arrest their disease. But to Gina's point, we're still in the dark about what the best treatment is for each person. And so um, between, uh, you know, personalizing the medication and the treatment strategies and the work that's underway with Pathways to Cures at the society at that international level, I think we're looking at an extremely promising future for a person living with MS and uh, seeing a cure within, within our, our future. Do you feel like there is a uh, real uh, possibility of, of finding a cure within the next uh, 10 years? Let's see. Can we raise hands? <laughs> there is a real possibility of finding a cure. There are several pathways to cures, as I mentioned, and I think there's a real possibility. And I think Sarah and I definitely agree on this. Um, the, the, the work is accelerating and we have to keep the pressure on to keep that work going and bringing the world together to make sure that the focus is clear. Um, so look for the Pathways to Cure. It's going to be open access. So the Pathways to Cure um, Cures Roadmap publication through MS Journal will be an open access opportunity um, in just a couple of weeks. 
And the benefits of this research go extends far beyond MS. Sarah Loud, CEO of the Accelerated Cure Project for Multiple Sclerosis, Gina Murdoch, President and CEO of Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and Cindy Zagiboilo, President and CEO of the National MS Society. Thank you so much for sharing all of this fantastic information. This has been so very useful. Everybody stay safe. We still have COVID to deal with. And, uh, and we'll see you on Thursday. Have a great day. Take care.